So this morning, well, during all the prayer requests, I feel that God has led me to a passage of Scripture um, this morning that's not where I was planning on going. So there seems to be a lot of hurt this morning, a lot of struggles, a lot of pain. Um, so I'm assuming it's the Holy Spirit. So this morning we're going to be going to Philippians chapter 4, which maybe many of you are very familiar with this passage. But it starts out in a unique way, um, where we're going to be starting out in verse, um, chapter 4, verse 4. And when you're having struggles and things are tough, this verse may kind of sound kind of funny to you. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now you may say, well, how does that fit into my suffering today, and how does that fit into the struggles? We heard many different prayer requests this morning of people hurting, of people that are not saved, of people that um, are in the hospital, um, and that happens all the time in our lives, does it not? There's always somebody around us that's in trouble one way or the other. So how can Paul, it must be he had it going pretty good, or he wouldn't have said that to the, uh, to the Philippians. Well, actually, Paul was in prison uh, when he wrote these words. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He was actually not in a very good place, and prisons did not have nice food back then, good food, and they didn't have warm facilities, and the rats weren't taken care of like they probably are today. Um, it was a bad place to be. It was wet, cold, they would be hungry, and yet Paul can say, rejoice, and then repeats it again, I say rejoice. So let's open our minds and hearts this morning as we come to his word to understand what God is trying to say to each one of us. Let's pray, ask him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that is real and powerful. We thank you that it's alive and it's um, relevant to what we're going through today, whatever that be. I pray for each one here who is maybe hurting themselves from their own sickness, their own struggles, but also... They're hurting maybe because of those that are close to them that they know and love who are struggling deeply. And so, Lord, guide us on this little journey as we look at how Paul could say rejoice in the midst of his suffering and how he encouraged us, he encouraged the Philippians, first of all, but also it's for us, too, on how we can also. In Jesus' name, amen. So you go down through, and uh, it says, let your, verse 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near. One of the key things he's trying to get out, uh, right out in the open immediately is why he can say rejoice always, because God is near. God is close. God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly the situation. He knows exactly the hurt and the pain and the suffering that you may be feeling right now and those that you love are feeling, because he's right here. He's not a distant God that's somewhere off somewhere and who does not know your, your uh, struggles. In fact, in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus saying he's not a God, high priest who cannot sympathize with your weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. Sad thing is, we have got the sin nature, so the problem with the sin nature is that we tend to go negative, do we not? We tend to go negative to the suffering in our own lives. We tend to go negative to the suffering in other people's lives. And so that makes it awful tough to rejoice, does it not, when the troubles come? It's hard to see anything positive that could ever come out of it. It's hard to see anything that could be relevant and needful in it because of our sin nature, which is what we've been talking about in Genesis 3, isn't it? So it says, rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near, or the Lord is at hand. But then he goes on to say a couple ways that you can try to have peace, joy, in the midst of the situations that you're going through. Verse 6. We're going to say the first step, you could say. It kind of breaks down a little bit nicely, so it's almost easy to preach in a way. But he says um, in verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, 
Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. What typically do we do when we're in troubles? What's the first thing we go to? Peace or anxiety? The sin nature says, oh my word, I'm out of control, now what? By the way, it was an illusion that you were ever in control to begin with. Okay? You never had control anyways, and some of you understand this more than others, that you're never in control. But don't we like to think we are? And sometimes I do things that seem to look like it's because I did them that they happen, and so it makes it awful tough to not think I'm in control. How about you? But really, every situation in every way, God is the master who's making it all happen, even if you're a participant in it, even if I am. He is in control, I am not. So why would I be anxious if I know that there's a loving God who's in control of everything and all things that happen in my life? I guess the question would be, first of all, do I believe that there's a loving God that's in control of everything and master of everything in my life? Right? We have to start by answering that question. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer... supplication with thanksgiving. Well, you may say, well, why does he use all them words? Because typically when we come to God in prayer, it's like, God, oh no, I'm in trouble, or no, this is happening. Please fix it. But a lot of times when we're praying, we're not thinking he's ever going to fix it. Or he's not going to fix it maybe the way that we think he should. And we think the only right way to fix the problem is the way that we think he should. Do we have that type of attitude in prayer? That we think we know exactly the way it should come about, and any other way is no good. There's a word there that makes all the difference in the way that we pray. And some of you know this word, you've seen it before. But it says this, with prayer, with what? You know what? Prayer with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Sorry, supplication with thanksgiving. I missed the word in there, didn't I? It messed you all up. With thanksgiving. So with thanksgiving so means that I have an attitude towards God ahead of time of what he's going to do in my life. In other words, I'm thankful while I'm praying about the answer that I'm going to get even though I don't know what his answer is going to be exactly. We're going to call that the first step to peace instead of anxiety in the to joy instead of misery in the midst of sorrows is to pray right. <laughs> right praying. Praying, thanking God ahead of time for what he's going to do, even though you don't even know it, but you trust him that whatever he does, however he answers that prayer, is exactly the best thing and the best way it could be answered. Even if you don't get it. Even if you don't understand why he answered it the way he did. Even if that loved one doesn't make it through. Even if that loved one doesn't get healed. Even if... Even if... Can we trust God and be thankful ahead of time when we're praying? We can, but is it tough? It's tough. Depending on how much you truly trust God to begin with. That he truly loves you that he's truly in control, and he truly cares about you and everybody else involved in the situation that you're praying for. How can you have joy in the midst of your suffering? Number one is to start praying right. Of course, it starts with the right attitude because it says rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. How do I, how do I have joy? I think sometimes joy follows right praying, not joy precedes it. In other words, when I pray, and this kind of can work in another area. If you're having trouble with somebody else, and you really dislike them bad, like maybe even hate, hate we don't want to use, say anybody here would ever hate anybody, but if you did, one of the ways to change your attitude is to start praying for them. 
you're not necessarily guaranteed they're going to change. But isn't it amazing? Anybody here ever prayed for somebody else and it changed your attitude towards them when you saw them the next time or whatever at some point in time in the future? That's what's supposed to happen. It's not necessarily me getting my will done in somebody else's life. It's when I pray, it's opening myself for God getting his will done in my life and my attitude. So right praying is what can help us through trials and troubles. To be thankful ahead of time for what God's going to do, not knowing what it is, but trusting that what he's doing is right and perfect and good. So he said, verse 6, we, I'll read it again. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And then he says, the result of that will be this. And the peace of God, which is beyond, surpasses, whatever your version is, all comprehension. In other words, we can't get it. Because it's not based on our situation. It's not because all of a sudden everybody was healed. It's not because everything worked out exactly the way we thought it was. We have peace because God supernaturally give, gave it to us. In the midst, in spite of the trouble, the circumstance that we're going through. And he says it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That word guards is like garrison. And uh, anybody here like westerns? Not very many anymore. I like westerns and I'm not ashamed of it. Okay. So, Gunsmoke, <laughs> Bonanza, whatever, you know. But anyways, I, when I, so this word uh, is what I think is called like garrison. And so I think of, like out in the West, a fort. What was a fort for? Protection, right? Protection. So God says that if I'm praying with thanksgiving, in other words, praying with the right attitude, that he will protect, he will garrison, he will fort, put a fort around my mind and my emotions. What typically gets me in trouble and gets me deeper into a hole and deeper into negativity when I'm, when I'm facing suffering? I think, right? Remember, we had that statement last year. Does anybody remember it? Hey, not too bad. Now let's try to do it together. I think. Hey, you remembered. Oh, my word. We don't even have this thing up anymore. Now, where was I going with that? <laughs> yes, protects mind and emotions. There we go. Thank you. So what happens is we start, our minds start thinking the negative of what's going on in my life and in the lives of those around me that I love. And then my emotions get involved. And if my emotions get maybe a little bit crazy and out of control, then my mind gets going more, and it becomes this vicious cycle that goes down into a deep pit if we let it keep going. Does that make sense? You ever have your, your emotions affect your thinking, and then your thinking affect your emotions, then your emotions affect your thinking, and you, and you started here where it weren't too bad, you were just a little bit concerned about the situation, then you ended up down here where there was no way out you felt like, and it was the worst ever possible scenario that was going to happen. That's because our mind and our emotions get in that whirlwind. And God says, if we pray, thanking Him ahead of time, in other words, trusting Him, that He will put a fort around our mind, our thinking, our emotions. He will protect them. He will keep them in. You know, that's, fences are good things. Although, if you've watched any Westerns, you'll know there was a lot of fights over fences too. But the point is, sometimes a fence is a good thing. You're trying to protect whatever's in that fence, right? From dangers that would be outside of it. And God wants to do that with our thinking and our emotions. He wants to protect them. But we first have to trust Him. And prayer not only shows our trust in Him, but along with that, and equal to it, I should say, goes along with it, is our dependence upon Him. Our dependence upon Him. God, I don't know what's right in this situation. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. Lord, I don't know how I can help somebody else in this that I love so much to get through it. I need your help. Not that I would like it along the way, God, thank you if you don't mind showing up. No, I need you, Lord. I need you in this because I am not going to think correctly without you. I am not going to have the right emotional stability 
without you. I need you. Right praying. When you're facing troubles and trials and situations, you need to start out by praying correctly. Praying brightly. Praying with the right attitude. All right, but he doesn't stop there. It's not just about praying. Verse 8. And not 8. Just verse 8. Is we're going to say is our next step. But they're not step in that 1, 2, 3 necessarily. It's kind of like all these together. Finally, to finish it off. But it can, uh, I think you can also have the idea of, and just as important, you know, not just this is the last thing. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence, and if anything were there praise, what's it say? Think about them once in a while. When you get a moment, think about something good. Bombard yourself with all the negative possible in your life, and once in a while, think on good thoughts. Allow trash in your head all the time, and then once in a while, for 20 minutes on a Sunday morning, think about God. Is that what he's saying? What's he say? Dwell. Some of you have another version. What's it, what else does it say? Meditate. It's the cow term. Some of you know this already. It's what a cow does. What, a cow has four stomachs. They chew food, and then they do what, Phil? Swallow it down, bring it back up. You may say, ew, that's gross. You do it every day. You take negative thoughts, and you grind on your teeth on them. And then you swallow them for a moment, but don't take them very far. You don't excrete them. You just swallow them, and you bring them back up. Is that too graphic for you? We need to excrete them. (laughs) There's other words for that, I understand, but I think that's the nicest one. The point is, a lot of times we're not dwelling, regurgitating on good things, positive things. We are regurgitating on the negative, and we wonder why we're so down, discouraged, depressed with the situations in our life that we don't understand. God says, dwell on the positive. Well, where do we know there's some positive things? Thank you. Good job. The Bible, the Word of God. That's where we know we have truth that is real and is good. Everywhere else, you better be questioning it. Because there's a lot of stuff that you're being bombarded with. It's a bunch of junk. And Christians are so defeated. And a lot of times it's just because they're so bombarded with the negative of this world. And is there negative in this world? And if you watch news 24-7, it's going to be hard for you to trust God. It's going to be hard for you to be optimistic because what is our news focused on? Are they telling you all the good things that happen well, what country was mentioned this morning in prayer? Puerto Rico. Did they tell you any of the good things going on? If you read like uh, Decision Magazine by Samaritan's Purse, you'll hear about all the people that are getting saved in the midst of this struggle. All the people that they're, as they're even in Texas and all the places they're going where they're building houses and they're just giving blankets and they're doing this and people are coming to know Christ as their Savior. But are you hearing that on the news? No, not too often. There's always good things going on, even in the midst of pain and hurt. And if I was to ask you guys here, how many of you came to know Christ as Savior in the midst of pain? I think it would be most of you. You don't usually come to Christ because, hey, I got it all together. I think I'm in control and everything's going well. It's pretty hard to get a rich man, you could say. Like like Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven, right? Easier for camel to go through the eye of a needle. But then he goes on, this, the dead disciples say, well then how can they be saved? But, and, the, and Jesus says, that's impossible with man, but with God all things are possible. So even somebody who's not going through struggles, but we do know that struggles do bring out good because many even here have come to know Christ because things weren't that great. 
and they realized it. So, we said the first point was right praying. The second point is right thinking. What are you dwelling on? What do you consume your mind with? If you're only listening to things that are of the Lord five minutes a day, and you're bomb- being bombarded with the things of the world 12 hours a day, why do you think you're living defeated and discouraged? Not saying that the troubles you're going through are something to take lightly. We're not saying that. We're saying, how are you handling it? You know, God challenges us as Christians to live differently than the world. We're, they're supposed to see us, see Him through us, not because we're perfect, because we're not, not because we got it all together, because we don't, but because they see that the God we have has it all together, and He's totally in control, and we handle things differently because of Him. Not because we're so good, not because we're so strong, but because we serve a God who's so strong. That's what brings people to Christ. So the second step there is right thinking. Right prayer, right thinking. What are you dwelling on? Well, prayer, thinking, what's next? All of us do things. Let's look at the next verse 9. These things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So what is he telling them now? Just go meditate on them and sit in a corner with nobody around? Act on them. Do it. Follow through. Let it be seen by the way you live your life. Let that right praying and that right thinking lead to right actions so that the way you handle life and the way you speak about what's going on shows a peace and a joy in the midst of not because you don't care. In the midst of your care and your concern and your, and your mourning, there's peace. Not because of the situation. Not because, and, and this can sometimes come about that people can say, well, you just don't care. Be careful not to look that way either. But you do care, but you have a God who cares more. And because of that, you can have a different attitude. Paul goes on to say, in this context, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. He's talking to the the Philippians. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned, talking about actions, but actions that lead to an attitude and and, uh, the way he lived his life. But I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Content sounds a lot like peace, doesn't it? Discontent is surely a lot like chaos. So contentment is a lot like peace, isn't it? If I'm content in my situation, if I'm content in wherever God has me right now, in the suffering that I'm in, it doesn't mean I have to like it. That gets a little weird, you know, where he doesn't want us to be wanting more pain and suffering. But can I be content with God in the midst of it? Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I have learned how to get along with humble means. I have learned how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. He said, I have learned it. learned it. Well, how do I learn how to be content? It started by a right prayer life and right thinking so that through the circumstances of life and some failures too, I'm sure, he learned to be content. When he had a lot, when he had a little. When everybody was healthy, when everybody was not. When they had enough money, when they didn't have enough. Learn to be content. It doesn't happen like this, though. You don't usually just get zapped with contentment. It's a learning process of taking every situation that you have, every trouble, to the Lord in prayer and trusting Him with it. 
It's a learning process of taking all those negatives and changing them into a positive thing, however you can, focusing on what's positive, not what's negative. Over time, then you've learned to be content in no matter what situation. Contentment just doesn't get zapped on you. It's something that you learn. You have to go through the trials of life and bring them to the Lord, like we just mentioned. How can I be content? It's learned. But learning isn't enough. You have to have a power inside you. Look at verse 13. Many of you know it by heart. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. There's an, that word do can also be translated endure. I can endure all things through Christ who gives me strength. So whatever struggle that you are going through this morning, with Christ, you can endure it. For whatever struggle that any loved one of yours is going through this morning, with Christ, you can still endure it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear under it. And I might have said like two versions, but it's the right verse. So it happens when you memorize in different versions. I might have mixed a couple versions there. But the point is this. He has promised to never give you more than you can handle. I heard it. Without him. That's a little disclaimer that's, that's assumed there. It's not said there, but it's assumed because look at the verse before it. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. What is it? If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. So he's already saying, you think you got it all? You think you got it? God has told you, you won't, he won't give you anything. But if you think you can do it on your own without him, you're going to fail. But with Christ, he has promised to never give us more than we can handle. And, and like I've heard said, but Lord, are you sure you know me? And there may be people here right now, today, that have that same thought. Lord, are you sure you know me? It just feels like it is too much. It just, just feels like it is too hard. It's too, it's too much to bear. I just want you to know, if you're a believer in Christ, it's never too much with Him. And He is always right there wanting to be real and powerful and present in your, what, in your life, in your situation, and in the people that you love. I don't know if that helps you this morning. But I think God laid that on my heart to share. Remember, whatever situation you're going through, pray right, trust God, be dependent upon Him, think right, don't allow yourself to continue to think the negative and go down that spiral into depression, misery. Think on those things that are true. What God's Word says, it is true. But do you trust it? Maybe praise the Lord, show me where I'm not. Like the, the guy said to Jesus, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And then start acting on it. And you will grow. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to grow in this area, but you'll grow in your ability to endure the trials that God has for you. It's interesting, the more that we endure trials with God, the easier it is with God to endure the next one. And by the way, just to encourage you, you're either <laughs> in the middle of a trial, just going through one, or cheer up, it's about ready to come. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for just uh, the church community that we have, Lord, because you have designed it on purpose. 
for the fact that we all struggle in this life. As sinners and because of sin and other sin and just all those reasons, Lord, we need each other. The accountability, the encouragement. And that's why you developed a thing called church. I, Lord, I pray for each one here who is struggling today. There was a lot of prayer requests this morning. A lot of hurt, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of concern. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll help each one here to pray, trust in you, to dwell on those things that are good, to maybe stop listening to some voices that they've been listening to, to put them aside. Even, Lord, show them which ones they need to get rid of. Maybe it needs to be a uh, turning off the TV. Maybe it needs to be listening to a different radio station. Maybe it needs to be even listening to different friends. Whatever it be, Lord, help them to know so that they can handle life with you, Lord. And show the world something different. Not because they're so strong or we're so strong, but because we serve a strong God, a caring God, a loving God. In Jesus' name, amen.